Next on the agenda, what I'd like to talk about is give you a little bit of an introduction of the ICED methodology, okay? This uh, program is designed to just be a day and a half to just give some of the educators an idea of what the program is with the hopes that before school starts, we will host one week workshops around the world to educate the educators and help them create curriculum for next year, okay? Okay, so I flew right after the Columbia accident, right? Uh, in Columbia, it, it launched July 20, um, uh, in July, in January, and uh, a large piece of foam broke off the external tank, hit the wing leading edge, and we all know what happened. The people on the ground did not think it was gonna be a problem. We lost the crew, as Thad mentioned, and we also lost the vehicle. And the causes of that accident were not only technical, it was behavioral, and it was also how the people made decisions on the ground and how they analyzed um, the seriousness of the problem. And so there was issues with critical thinking skills and also being able to connect with the right people at NASA that had the expertise that could help the people. One of the biggest um, problems, behavioral problems, was a lack of psychological safety on the ground, okay? And so we developed this program. The other thing I realized was that we not only had problems educating people at NASA, but we were struggling to educate people in the United States and around the world. Even though the United States spends a tremendous amount of money, we were not seeing the results in, in the students. Okay, as they would take these national tests. And why was this? We believe it's because a lot of these programs, and this is just uh, programs in computer science, all around the world, these kids are going to these amazing programs, but there was no linkage. There was no integration of these programs. The educators were not able to scaffold what was being taught and guide the students in these programs. When we look at the STEM pipeline, right, what we find is that we lose about 80% of the students by the seventh grade. They lose interest in STEM. And why is this? And by freshman year in college, we're, we're left with only 9% of the students uh, declare a STEM major. And by sophomore year, by, by junior year, it's reduced to like 4.5%. And why is this? I really believe. That's because these students, even though they're gifted and love STEM, love science um, and engineering, in freshman year, they're not seeing that connection between these very difficult math courses and science courses and where their passion is. Yet, we know that students love to, uh, love to be gamers, and, and so they, they choose gaming, and there's a reason for that. They want to be a part of something bigger than, than themselves. And so when I thought about this and I thought about what NASA has to offer, I really believe um, we could solve all three of these problems. And so the Epic Challenge program was developed um, in order to help motivate students, inspire students um, in, in, in learning the STEM subjects. Uh, we're also looking at making the pedagogy um, um, engaging right? So we're looking at active learning, phenomenon-based learning, and also um, problem-based learning. And when you look at the problems that NASA has in the space program, we have these amazing multidisciplinary problems, and we need to teach young students and even old students how to think critically, how to work together on teams, and how to uh, be creative in how they solve these problems. So we developed this methodology, it's called ICED. And so these are the different uh, phases of that program. The first phase is knowledge capture. And so we're gonna go through this very condensed two-day um, workshop, if you will. And we're gonna condense this program into two days. It's really a full year program. And so the first phase is knowledge capture. We immerse the students in the problem. We teach them everything they need to know about the problem with subject matter experts. We teach them how to search for information. 
how to share that information with other members on their team. So it's all about team building and getting the students to work together in teams. The next phase is creative concept generation. That's where we teach the students skills so that individually all students are creative, right? But we want to teach them how to, the, how to raise the collective creativity of their teams. Okay, so we do things like biologically inspired design. You can be hearing from Professor Sven Bellin at Penn State, teaches trees, the theory of inventive problem solving, teach them to generate really innovative, out of the box ideas. And then we teach them how to evaluate those ideas. The last phase is how they rapidly mature those ideas by what we call rapid concept development. Okay, and so we rapidly teach them how to fail smart, fast, small, cheap, early and often, how to learn by, by going out there, testing their theories, testing their ideas in a laboratory. And when you look in the upper right, you know, it, this is not only for students, but most company fails, fail in the conceptual design phase. A lot of companies select one design very early on, and they proceed to try to develop that, that concept and they run into trouble downstream. So one of the things we teach students and what, what, how I learned as a very young research engineer is how do you develop knowledge? How do you create knowledge? How do you learn? And so typically what scientists do, they observe what's happening in nature and we develop some mathematical model or some analytical model to represent what we think we're seeing in nature. And then we verify that analysis by going and creating a laboratory experiment, an intelligent experiment to test out those theories, right? And the double-ended arrow basically means that many times our assumptions in our analysis might be incorrect, incomplete. And so they don't correlate well with our experiments. But once we test, all these different ideas, test to failure, vary lots of different parameters, and our analysis is accurate, then we can move to what we call the design phase. Okay, and that's what you're gonna be seeing when we run this program. We have a simulation phase, and then we have the actual experiments with the robot, right? You use the simulation phase to basically test that design space, test your theories, test your ideas, and then when you come up with a good strategy or a theory, then you go back in the laboratory and you conduct an experiment, okay? Do a complete circle. The other thing we test our students and also our young NASA engineers is the building block approach, right? We teach them how to fail, how to fail smart, fast, small, cheap, early and often. And very early on, you test in the laboratory your ideas very simply and inexpensively in, in, in test. And so this is just an idea of a, that we had for a, a reusable cryogenic tank many years ago. It was a, a composite honeycomb core that was evacuated, a sandwich core. And we tested many ideas for evacuating this honeycomb core in the laboratory. We saw it was almost impossible to create a vacuum. And, um, but yet what happened was when the actual program went down the path of selecting a full-scale design. They, they, they chose this very complicated multi-lobe tank made out of composite materials, and they missed a critical failure mechanism very early on. They did not understand that that honeycomb core would not maintain a vacuum. Liquid hydrogen and gas would basically pump into the honeycomb core. And then when that honeycomb got heated up, the, the gas evaporated, and, and the high pressure within those honeycomb cells basically blew the composite uh, sandwich panel apart. When this happens late in the design program, it can cancel the entire program. And so that X33 program, where we were trying to build a reusable re-entry vehicle, a reusable launch vehicle, was totally canceled because of that one failure. So we started this program, we started developing the methodology and creating a curriculum. And we uh, exercised these ideas very early on, right after the Columbia accident, trying to understand what caused the accident, right? How that foam basically impacted the wing leading edge. 
Then when I was chosen to eventually fly, right, we were looking at ways to actually repair a hole in the wing leading edge so that when we flew, if debris hit our wing, two astronauts would go out and do a spacewalk to fix the wing leading edge. And you'll hear a little bit about that later in the program. So what we did was we formed this um, methodology, this curriculum, and we decided to try it on 30 young NASA engineers. We had a team of researchers and, and professors from Penn State, Georgia Tech, and MIT. You'll hear from two of those original creators of the ICE methodology today. And we, we tried to solve a problem that NASA couldn't solve. That's why the, we call these epic challenges, right? We try to pick challenges that are very complex and challenges that even NASA struggles with. So what we did was we took 30 young NASA engineers and we went worked, um, we had them attend a workshop at Penn State. We guided them through this ICED methodology. They used the learning factory at Penn State to basically uh, do the analysis on the computer systems, the computer-aided design systems there. They used the learning factory to actually build small um, test experiments to test their ideas. And what happened was we ended up with about a dozen or so really great ideas that looked like they'd be promising for astronauts to survive a land landing of a capsule. NASA is still trying to land capsules on land. So is industry right now. And we took one of those ideas, a personalized airbag um, system. And we had one graduate student from MIT, Sydney Doe, who now works at the Jet Propulsion Lab. And together with undergraduates from Penn State and MIT, they basically came up with a system that would survive entry, a land landing, and safely land astronauts. And not only that, but it would save 36% mass in the, uh, in the capsule system and also increase the volume within that capsule, that cramped capsule, by 26%. So what this showed was that th this idea works. We could use this, this technology. We could take these very complex problems that NASA is trying to solve, and we can bring them into the classroom. And imagine if we now bring this to classrooms around the world, thousands of students, tens of thousands of students, hundreds of thousands of students working on these many different problems that NASA is trying to solve, we would have hundreds of thousands of ideas, different ideas that these students at many different age levels would be able to mature. So this is the layout of the methodology. It really isn't linear. It doesn't just go in a linear fashion from problem definition to concept evaluation, right? Along that path, your students are immersed in the problem and they're learning about that problem as they're continuing to learn of the skills that they're going to need in order to solve the problem. One of the critical skills is how do they research the problem as a team? How do they search online effectively, not only for content, but also for subject matter experts around the world? They're taught how to work together on the team. And also, like we said, creativity um, and ideation concept evaluation. So they're learning these skills and they're applying these skills and they're advancing in their understanding. So why do we pick an epic challenge? Uh, we talked about it a little bit. We, the, uh, what is an epic challenge? And there are many challenges out there and why is that important? I really believe the epic challenge, the more difficult the problem, the more it motivates students to be creative in how they solve the problem. It gives them a license to try things and fail. So the ICE methodology is all about trying things and failing and also learning from failure, okay? And so it's important because it motivates, it creates that sense of urgency. And so there's a way to create the challenge to motivate the students and keep them motivated. These are some of the challenges that I worked on during my career of the National Aerospace Plane. We are still trying uh, to build a hypersonic vehicle that takes off like an airplane, flies to space. Heard a little bit about the single stage to orbit vehicle that we attempted to develop 
And what you'll hear about a little bit later on is one of those tasks, which was designing a system for repairing a wing leading edge. We use uh, problem-based learning and also what's called phenomenon-based learning. And if you look at a traditional, uh, the way courses are traditionally taught Bloom's tax, uh, using Bloom's taxonomy, it follows a pretty linear approach. Knowledge, we basically instruct the students on what they need to learn. They regurgitate what they learned. We test them to understand if they comprehend it, and then they apply it. In phenomenon-based learning on, in the middle of this, you notice it takes kind of a roller coaster path. We immerse them in the phenomenon. We teach them how to functionally decompose that problem, right? And, and to learn about it. And then how do you reconstruct that problem? How those different elements of knowledge are connected, right? Construct it and then um, actually analyze and test your ideas and your understanding of the problem. We based the whole methodology on many years of, of, of experience at NASA, running lots of different programs in lots of different programs. And so we base it and we use these as case studies for the educators. The way the program is designed to work, we really need to look at all the different educational levels, right? Because they have to be connected. So at the very top, we create a challenge it's a multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary complex challenge, right? We have experts basically um, um, immerse the students in that challenge, develop the modeling and simulation tools necessary to understand uh, the problem. And we work with graduate students and undergraduate students that help us solve the problem at these different levels. They help create the, the um, the learning modules, the modeling and simulation tools that the youngest students are going to need. And what usually happens is the really creative ideas come from our youngest students, right? But they don't understand how to solve these problems. And so they're drawn to, to connect with their near peers, to understand what they need to know. It pulls them in this learning path. And we really want to foster this continuum of mentorship from the graduate students, just like Sidney Doe, mentoring the undergraduate students down to the educators and the students at the high school level. And so we really, what we're trying to do now is to develop these locations around the world where we're connecting universities, community college, high schools, and middle schools to work together as a team. And the skills that they will learn, these are the different um, types of uh, skills that the students learn throughout this program. Teamwork, which is very important. How do they work together as a team? How do they lead as a team? How do they access and, and create knowledge as a team? How do they network and communicate effectively? How do they reach out to the right subject matter experts that can help them advance and accelerate their learning? The systems nature of problems, which you'll be learning about from Ali Devec. Um, next on our list, Ali Devec is going to talk a little bit about systems engineering and, and functional decomposition, how all these elements of this problem at a high level are related. You're working at a small part of the problem. The changes you make at that level affect everything up, and you have to understand how it affects the, affects the system. Hi, and Charlie. If, I'm here. Great to, to hear you and see you. Okay. Excellent. That's our next speaker, right? So I am going to stop sharing.